A lot of tension arises from issues related to weight, whether we're talking about anorexia, bulimia, or obesity. Obesity really does carry a very significant social um, stigma. There are prejudice and discrimination that surround issues of obesity. And nurses, as members of the society at large, often share many of those same feelings. For example, when a nurse approaches me and rather than saying, what's the best way we can manage this patient during the acute hospitalization, I'm asked questions, for example, like, um, how did this patient get so large in the first place? Or shouldn't we try to help the patient lose weight during this hospitalization? I always appreciate those kinds of statements because it reminds us that obesity does carry moral dimensions. And along with that, we need to recognize that it influences our patient care. If a well-meaning clinician attempts to help a patient lose weight during a hospitalization without, without an in-depth knowledge of the tools necessary uh, for weight loss, that's very similar to a nurse trying to help a patient lose, um, reduce blood sugar, for example, in a diabetic patient without appropriate therapeutic intervention and support. Uh, so for that reason, I think that we need to realize that we best serve our patients by viewing obesity as the chronic illness that it is. You see, it's difficult for nurses to manage the numerous physical challenges that the patient presents if we color our feelings and our therapeutic interventions with some of these moral overtones. Sometimes we can allow patients then to take on the quality of otherness and our care can be inadequate and we can justify that because we blame the patients for the numerous complications that arise. So it's very important for us to understand that therapeutic intervention can be clouded by moral overtones. About how interdisciplinary um, teams can be developed in better um, putting together uh, patient plans. By employing strategies to prevent or eliminate these often preventable complications, what you'll be doing is you'll be improving the quality of your patient's care. You'll be increasing satisfaction of the patient, the family, and yourself, clinicians, and you'll be controlling unnecessary costs. So before I really get started with the skin and wound, I'd like to talk about why patients wait so long to come into the hospital. Needs of the obese patient are not unlike needs of the non-obese patient. However, sometimes these needs are aggravated. They're aggravated because of the patient's size and other numerous factors, such as immobility, a prolonged hospitalization, and coexisting diseases. Atherosclerosis, diabetes, hypertension, some kinds of cancers, and soft tissue infections are often associated with obesity. When your patients come into the hospital, they complain of um, a lack of privacy and a loss of control. And patients who otherwise um, are very independent in their home setting, they become very dependent in the hospital setting. Now, many patients defer hospital as long, hospitalization as long as possible. And that's because they're embarrassed about their physical appearance. Many times we don't have adequate equipment for the patient. It's embarrassing for them. For example, simple equipment, equipment such as a blood pressure cuff or scales are largely inadequate. Um, I had a, pa a nurse that called me from the Midwest that said that there really was insufficient staff to position and turn a very heavy patient. Many of the patients could be uncooperative, sedated, or in pain. Hospital, they had full-blown cellulitis, and then they required a long hospitalization. 
Uh, now as I moved into some of the four more common skin conditions, the first one I'm going to talk about is pressure ulcers. Um, pressure ulcers are considered largely preventable. Skin, the largest organ of the body, is at great risk uh, for breakdown in relation to obesity. Uh, and probably prevention has long been considered a cost-effective alternative to treatment. And so many of you may be using the Braden or the Norton scale for risk assessment and then employing prevention. Now you know that many of your obese patients will be at risk for developing pressure ulcers. Go ahead and use your assessment scale, determine the patients at risk, and then go ahead and employ those prevention strategies that are helpful. The Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research has given us five criteria. Their pressure reduction, frequent repositioning of the patient, moisture control, nutrition, and education. Let me go over those real quickly. Uh, pressure reduction is achieved through pressure reduction surfaces, and there are products on the market that you can order for your morbidly obese patient that will reduce interface pressure, and that's anything lower than 32 millimeters of mercury pressure. Um, and patient repositioning, it's difficult to turn a very large patient, and so there is oversized equipment to be helpful with you for that. Moisture control, I mean moisture from perspiration, wound drainage, or incontinence. And nutrition, which I'll talk a little bit more about when I get to wound healing, and then finally education. When you're educating your patient and your patient's family, make sure that you document that, and so you all know that you're um, addressing some of the educational needs in relation to skin care. Now, there are four stages of pressure ulcers that are largely characterized by, um, defined by depth of injury. So I want to go over those very quickly, and then I want to talk about unusual skin injury that develops in obesity. There are four stages of pressure ulcers, as defined by the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, the Wound o uh, Ostomy Continence Nurses Society, and the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research. Stage one is prolonged redness of intact skin. This is the most significant with nursing intervention. When your patient has a stage one, the patient needs to have prevention strategy, otherwise that will deteriorate further on. Stage two is a superficial break in the skin or a blister. Stage three and four are both full thickness skin breakdown. Stage three extends to the fascia, but not through it. And stage four extends into muscle, bone, and tendon. Now, pressure ulcers largely develop over bony prominences or over soft tissue where there's sufficient pressure for a long enough period of time to cause soft tissue necrosis. Now, this can happen in obesity in several ways. The first is between skin folds. We need to really look between the skin folds. We need to turn the patients frequently, otherwise this will happen. You might ask, well, how come patients at home don't develop pressure ulcers between the skin folds? This is because the patient is up, moving around, and the pressure is shifting. When the patient's lying in bed for prolonged periods of time, that pressure doesn't shift. Um, the second is tubes and catheters must be repositioned every two hours. If a very large patient is laying on a tube for a sufficient period of time, it can cause pressure necrosis along where that tube was. If the patient has a gastrostomy tube within a fold, then you know that that tube really needs to be moved side to side so it doesn't cause that problem. A third area is that many times patients do not sleep in beds at home and they sleep in recliners. Many of those recliners have hard surfaces at the side. The patients can outgrow those chairs and develop bilateral hip ulcers. These are three kinds of different pressure ulcers than what we would normally see in the hospital that you would look out for with your morbidly obese patients. However, they need to be staged and treated as pressure ulcers. The, National, the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research has guidelines for prevention and treatment of pressure ulcers, and I would encourage you to get a copy of those guidelines um, to put together your plan of care. So in summary, I want to say that an interdisciplinary, organ organizationally based, focused team can put together these hospital-wide programs so that you have the equipment and the information and the policies and procedures in place before your patient ever comes through the door. Thank you.